Hey, Thomas. How are we? Mate, we're good. And we'll let all the listeners know this is the third time that we've tried to record this podcast. So what we're going to do, friends Great and time. our listeners of the show, we're not going to do any shit talking. We're going to get straight into it and uh, we're going we're gonna to hope for the best. <laughs> Absolutely. We have a wonderful uh, gentleman on the show. His name is Oscar Meerman. He's a friend of mine. He is a, a previous um, co-worker slash colleague of mine who we've been able to exchange ideas over many uh, months slash years in the past. Uh, and I've, I've also been a student of his in the art of uh, calisthenics and hand balancing. And uh, he's taught me so much about uh, so many things. So Oscar has been able to work uh, with people to develop their movement abilities in the form of hand balancing, body weight skills, holistic, whole body strength, mobility, and health, and a very broad spectrum of other aspects of movement and training. He also helps people to refine a relationship with their training, body, mind, which is creative and sustainable, helping them to relate uh, to reach a place where they enjoy what they are doing and is cohesive with the rest of their lifestyle. Further to this, he is also uh, able to teach people uh, uh, his meditation style that he has really been able to uh, thrust himself into over the last uh, few years and create awareness that grows, sense of self shifts, old stresses and ideas that people and he can help facilitate let go of. Oscar, welcome to the show, my friend. Very, very exciting to have you on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, boys, for having me on. Third time's a charm, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Oz, mate, uh, th- there's so much to cover in, in this show. I just want to uh, start with the, uh, the beginnings of it. Um, what inspired you to get into, and uh, I could be making an assumption here, but what inspired you to get into movement as a practice initially? So uh, what inspired me was I, I started training formally, you know, that wasn't like a sport or anything like that at about the age of 13 or so. And I think I share a pretty common uh, inspiration with a lot of 13-year-old boys. I just wanted to get jacked, you know, like pick up some girls, you know, kind of fill out my high school uniform a little bit, you know how it goes. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then... Yeah, so so I pursued that for, oh, yeah. Well, I, I still I'm still training, I guess. Uh, but I was hitting the gym, you know, before or after school, pretty much most days. Uh, and then, at about the age of, mm, I'm gonna say 16, uh, I started to experience a little bit of bullying at my school. And the bullying kind of escalated, like it, it continued to escalate, and then got, I guess, reached a crescendo right at the end of the school year, and you know, I, I faced this two weeks of, of holiday break and I'm like, all right, I got to do something about this because it's pretty, pretty intolerable to be at my school right now uh, in the current kind of situation. And so I thought I will go to this jujitsu club around the corner from me and learn some skills so that I know how to deal with this physical confrontation and this, uh, I guess this conflict dialogue that I was experiencing physically that I'd never had to deal with in my life before. And I didn't really have any skills from any of my other experiences to bring into this realm of, yeah, how do I hold my own physically against somebody else in this, uh, yeah, in the conflict dialogue. So I spent that two months, uh, you know, pretty much in this like self-inflicted training camp, I guess, of spending, you know, anywhere from two to five hours a day at the jujitsu club, um, going to still hitting the gym, you know, trying to get strong and all that. And yeah, I I came back to school after that, that two month period. And, um, I was, I was kind of unbulliable at at that stage physically anyway, you know, uh, there's, there's always stuff to work on, but that was kind of my first experience into, I guess, deviating from the linear path of training being, you know, lifting weights in the weight room just to, I guess, build some aesthetics or just because that seemed the, the thing to do. And then, you know, I kind of deviated into this world of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which, uh, as I'm sure a lot of listeners know at the moment, uh, it's very, <laughs> popular. it's a very open world, incredibly creative, innovative uh, and very non-conventional in many ways. 
And I was also fortunate to have some teachers at that school who were, um, you know, I say this word with love. They were massive weirdos. (laughs) (laughs) I get it. (laughs) They were weirdos even inside the space of jujitsu when jujitsu was already weird oddity. Uh, You know, this was like before UFC got really popular. Um, it was still seen as this like weird thing where you put on pajamas and cuddle, mm-hmm. <laughs> aggressive cuddling kind of thing in pajamas. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> um, my teachers kind of taught me this, this very valuable lesson that uh, movement can be quote unquote natural. Um, and, you know, at the time the word natural movement uh, it, it meant something very different to me, but I guess if I look back, it was essentially just uh, unraveling this kind of evolutionary perspective of what is the body meant to be doing? Uh, like, where did we come from? Uh, what are we capable of? But really mainly uh, the perspective of breaking social conditioning. Mm-hmm. So social conditioning being, I'll give you some examples here. And we'll go like top down social uh, social conditioning being the knees shouldn't travel in front of the toes. It's bad for the knee or the, the low back should never go out of neutral because it would be bad for the back. Um, You have to sleep, so uh, sleep a certain amount of hours per night. You can't train the same body part more than X amount of times per week, etc. And Mm. so it really taught me that you can kind of do anything you want as long as you're smart about it and as long as that's truly the path for you. Mm. If you are really trying it. Yeah. Mm. And obviously there's a lot of nuance to that, you know. Um, you have to be aware of dosage, right? Your medicine could be another man's poison and your own medicine mm-hmm. could be your own poison just at different times of your life. Um and so, yeah, that that really kind of set me on this path, kind of launched me on this path of curiosity with the whole movement space and being non-conventional. Uh, and I guess looking for something that was a bit closer to what the human body could really kind of grow into in terms of different options of movement capabilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I left school, I didn't really know what to do other than I loved teaching my friends how to do what I did. Like I was always, you know, I had like one friend on rotation every two months coming to my jujitsu school where I'd show them some stuff and then they drop out and another one would come. Uh, my friends would always join me for the gym and I, I always just enjoyed teaching them stuff. Um, uh, and yeah, I would enjoy teaching just as much, if not more than, than practicing myself. So when I left school, I just threw myself into, into coaching. Uh, I started, getting into CrossFit and coaching CrossFit classes where I met some other very amazing influences. Um, yeah. And from there, CrossFit kind of showed, I, I guess CrossFit went back into that conventional training model, you know, being back in the gym, whereas I'd been mainly in jujitsu for a few years, but CrossFit is this very general approach uh, within certain limits, of course, but you know, it works with the gymnastics rings uh, it gets you doing basic athletic training and jumping, running, uh, some agility work, uh, throwing. It teaches the Olympic lifts, which is amazing. And it exposes you to training all of the energy systems. And it also gives you this exposure to the paleo diet, which at the time in CrossFit was massive. This was like 12 years ago, I guess. And paleo was kind of like, I guess, what is it like? Yeah, it's, it was like the old school raw liver. Like yeah, today. that's a good point. That's a really good yeah, point. Yeah. Eat meat, fruit, nuts, and seeds and do all these exercises. I remember that 100 word thing or whatever it was. It was like in every CrossFit box. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Like it's the Holy Bible. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, the, the CrossFit experience really opened up the spectrum of, I guess, traditional linear training for me again and exposed me to a bunch of these disciplines being weightlifting, gymnastics, et cetera. Uh, from there, I went in again and I specialized in Olympic weightlifting for two or three years and I competed and basically just really specialized in a few lifts on the barbell, tried to get really strong with that. And I, I don't know if you competed. That's cool. I did. Yeah. 
Mm. Not like, you know, crazy levels or anything. Um, no, 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 but you competed. It's like mm. specialized. Yes. Yeah. Very specialized. Um, very, very specialized. In fact, I was uh, snatching more than I could overhead squat and I was cleaning, jerk, oh, wow. uh, cleaning, jerking my max front squat. So super specialized technically. Um, yeah. I feel like a lot of that actually happens to CrossFitters. Like I remember like a lot of, even when I was coaching and so forth, you know, you see a lot of guys who can clean much more than they can front squat, as you said, you know, snatch more than they can overhead squat because, you know, you train to be good at CrossFit as opposed to training all these accessory movements to get really good just at two movements being the snatch and the clean and jerk. So there'd be all of this like kind of weird overlap and dudes would be like, you know, um, um, squatting way more than they could deadlift, which is obviously pretty standard when it comes to powerlifting. But um, yeah, just it's it's interesting how when you do like whether it just be CrossFit or whether it just be calisthenics or whatever it is, even though some of those movements are are actually the fundamentals of other sports, you see a very weird end result. Mm. Yes, I mean, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I moved into specialization in uh, Olympic lifting as well. It's a, it's it's amazing because part of I feel like you can deviate into so many different paths and a lot of people who choose to go narrow and deep can, can, can kind of select various different paths. But with you, so like CrossFit's essentially comprised of cardio, um, gymnastics based movement, um, classic strength, strength movements, but also Olympic movements. It sounds like you took care of Olympic movements and, um, oh, obviously there's mobility components to it as well, but there's, uh, you kind of took care of a chapter of your life with Olympic, but also where, from correct me if I'm wrong, plays a big part in your life is gymnastics training uh, and, and classic strength and conditioning. Mm. Yes. So, yeah, when I was doing the Olympic lifting, I very much went into the headspace of what I was saying before, right? Like the back should only be neutral when you lift or else it's bad. Uh, you know, I very much went into the the mindset of, the social conditioning, like I was saying before, like this is the way to do things. The body is designed to move in this way. And yeah, I'm very grateful that I got to really be fully enthralled in that mentality because now I can, when people come to me in that mentality, when they're kind of stuck in, in ways, maybe they're hurting themselves because they're just drilling in a certain cue, for example, in their, in their training. Um, yeah, I can really help them with that perspective because I've been through that. Uh, but yeah, basically from being in that perspective and being specialized like that for two, three years, it got to this point where like, it just became more and more unsustainable. And I'm like, man, if I'm going to stay here, I'm going to start to seriously sacrifice some health. And I just, yeah, I didn't want to pay those prices to, to specialize further. Uh, down mm -hmm. the and so I kind of wandered about for, you know, six months or so. And then I ended up finding the work of Mr. Edo Portal. And that just kind of popped things out again for me. Um, from that point, yeah, it turned into, I did his online coaching and it turned into a lot of gymnastics, strength, conditioning, a lot, lots of hand balancing. Um, back in the day, you know, I guess what nine years ago now would be, um, it was pretty much train five hours a day or, or nothing. That was the program. Um, so a lot of mobility. For the people for the people listening at home that that don't know who Ido Portal is, um, I'm, I'm assuming that there are, are a great deal of people that do know who he is. But for those that don't, can you encapsulate his philosophy on training? Um, <laughs> and you've got two sentences. Go. <laughs> <laughs> to take a general. Obviously, you're not speaking for training. Me, no. I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not Edo, but um, yeah. To, to take a general movement approach to training so that your training can be optimally transferable to other disciplines. It can give you greater awareness of yourself and your practice. And you have the most amount of freedom within yourself and within your practice. And then that would look like doing a lot of different things, whether that's mm. boxing, weightlifting, gymnastics, hand balancing, acrobatics, dancing, arm wrestling, 
like the the containers can change, but then the contents of trying to develop awareness, develop this internal freedom, this physical freedom kind of stays the same and it just changes costumes or containers, I guess. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Oscar, I can't help but put a counselor's hat on. Um, uh, it's, uh, it just, I just went, when you were talking about bullying, um, I'd love to dive into that, excuse me, a little bit more before we move into the movement. Cause I just want to have further context as to who you are and what motivates you. Do you still feel, um, that bullying for you was the thing that, that changed the course and how, how do you kind of like look back on those experiences, um, in your development? Um, um, as a, as an adult now. Mm. Yeah. Super funny. Hey, because like we cast our perspective now, you know, which is so much greater on the memory that we have of ourselves, where mm. our is great or developed. Uh, it's, it's very, very interesting. That experience of casting our awareness back through time like that. Mm. Um, if I look back, I was always looking for the same thing. Always. It's just more. It was yes. The- to know myself more. Uh, and we can take that quite big if you want to. I don't know the scope of this podcast, but if I look there's back- no, There's just no such thing as a scope. It's just an anything, <laughs> limitless, non-categorical <laughs> talk. <laughs> so yeah, I was always wanting one. I increase my awareness and increase my sense of oneness and connection with all things and all experiences. That's all I was looking for. And if I look at- I have one. Sorry, continue, Oscar. Um, if I look at whatever container I tried to take part in, whether it was, you know, the jujitsu or the training or whatever, it was always looking for that. Um, Mm. and so with the, with that whole bullying thing, uh, the bullying was the catalyst, like the bullying was that kind of container of suffering, I guess. And suffering is such an amazing catalyst for all of us. And really like, when do we change? Usually we change our behavior and we change our nature when the suffering gets bad enough. How bad does it have to get? Bad enough. Uh, bad yeah. enough where it's intolerable for you at that time. Uh, mm. Some people can put up with like whoa, crazy amounts of suffering where you just kind of look at them from the outside and you're like, whoa, I couldn't stand that at all. Or, and the, the opposite can be true. So for me, the bullying was just that kind of like external catalyst for the internal suffering to be bad enough for me to do something about it. And the thing that I did was, I guess I went into that arena, that, that physical arena of uh, physical conflict. And I spent a lot of time there, a lot of time. And I had to let go of a lot of stuff, uh, internal competitiveness, uh, and you know, if my friends are listening to this now, they'll they'll probably laugh when when they hear this because I'm still very competitive. But I like to think that I try and nurture my competitiveness in in nice ways now. But uh, yeah, I had to let go of a lot of this kind of comparing myself to others. So like, if I won a fight, didn't matter. If I lost a fight, didn't matter. There's always just this learning process going on. Mm. I had to develop uh, humility, right? In jujitsu, for those of you who don't know, the fight ends when you tap. So you, you tap the opponent or you tap the mat and you basically say, you win, I lose like this exchange. And it's also very powerful because it's not like, uh, you know, if you're playing chess or something, you know, I oh, checkmate, you would have taken my king, but in jujitsu checkmate means you would have broken my elbow or you would have choked me unconscious or broken my knee or my wrist or something like this. So like rupture the peck, rupture the peck, all sorts of like very real stuff to the, you know, to the body. Yeah. Uh, very close to home. And, you know, the, the experience of it as well, right? Like maybe you've got this like huge guy, like just crushing you. And it's just, oh, been an experience. You tap out at the end. You're like, wow, I had nothing there. Mm. So it really taught me some humility. And through that also taught me compassion. And so when I came back and I, I don't want to. I don't want to even use the word confronted my bully, uh, because I didn't confront him. I just became unbullyable from him anymore, mm-hmm. because I also had this compassion to where he was coming from, 
Uh, I had no desire to beat him in any kind of conflict. I had no desire to embarrass him. My only desire was for him to just stop that behavior that he was doing. Mm, mm. It almost sounds like you were able to um, uh, also, and perhaps more importantly, confront your own projection of the bully. Definitely. Yeah. It's or, awesome. Like one, one step further, right? The projection of myself onto the bully. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And it's also a good thing he didn't beat you up <laughs> and you didn't beat him up as well. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm just always, and I'm sorry, Paulie, I know you had a question before. I just, I always get so interested. Um, um, not so much in terms of what initially drives people to do something, because I think you, you're pretty spot on with that. People have you know, pressure builds, you know, you mentioned the word suffering as a catalyst for growth and change, you know, suffering is that, that notion of who I'm being right now, how I'm presenting the world has to die in some way for something else to happen here. Cause I'm just continually hitting my head on a brick wall here, you know? Um, and then you um, and initially go off into the world and, and you, you do what you need to do. But then when you come back and you've actually been able to integrate a lot of those lessons and experiences into a, into a business and a philosophy now, what I'm really interested in is how you look back on the initial self, you know, and what are some of the pers- perspective changes and shifts that, that go on there. And, you know, what what's so wonderful to hear is that you've not only had a giant perspective shift upon yourself and that awareness and that you were always seeking greater connection with self and the world, but you, you've also had a giant perspective shift on how you saw the bully, you know, which is like next level transcendence, which is, which is really great, you know? Yes. Um, So are you, sorry, you just to understand your question uh, in more detail, are you asking how I've then applied that into what I do currently or how I look back at that, that shift? No, I don't even think it was a question. <laughs> I just, I think I had an initial question, but um, yeah, I was just, I was really interested into how you kind of, you know, integrated that whole thing. And, you know, it sounds like you've been able to move on from that now, which I think is really wonderful. I never had, I actually, I had a, a single bully, um, but he wasn't really a bully. He was just kind of like an arrogant fella who also used to be a mate who, you know, like I never really had that experience. Um, so I'm always fascinated. And I've also never had it gone through a terrible breakup either. So two things that are so common, massive existential crises for people I've never really had. So I'm constantly like, tell me what it was like. <laughs> it's crazy to me, you know, but Paulie, what were you going to say? I had a question, but I feel like it's kind of been covered, but I'll just like encapsulate it briefly because I want to move on to um, the current Oscar, which obviously past Oscar has developed into. But um, my question was when you when you came back to uh, school and, and your approach to this bully, uh, do you feel like the person you were before you stepped into Brazilian uh before you stepped into jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu was was responsible for this almost um really evolved uh, approach to dealing with um with this bully or do you feel like the tenets that you learned from jiu-jitsu um allowed you to uh, approach that with compassion and humility or did <laughs> jiu-jitsu add to who you were as a human being and the new Oscar at that point was able to uh, develop uh, and create compassion in this situation? D, all of the above. <laughs> yeah. So I guess initially I'm, I'm blessed to have two parents uh, who really set the example. So my, my mom is always super health focused. And so I had this perspective looking at her uh, of, all right, like making healthy choices is a thing that you probably should do. And here's the example of how to do that. And then my father, although in many ways he's a pretty good guy, but in terms of health, like chalk and cheese with my mum, uh, but he is a professional flamenco guitarist. So he would spend four hours a day practicing. Uh, he'd work a full, you know, nine to five or more and then get home and practice or play guitar. So I had these two two examples, the the craftsman and the practitioner of like, right, if you want to develop something, you just practice. How much do you practice? More until you develop it. Uh, and it's it's a very normal thing to 
uh, be practicing things as you're talking to people. Like he would be practicing his finger patterns uh, underneath the dinner table as like as he's having dinner. And so I have this example of someone who's always practicing 24 seven and does formal sessions a lot. And then someone who's very healthy and works more through the body, I guess, than an instrument. And so when I encountered this problem, I was like, okay, so I'm going to work on myself and my body in this practice way that I have two examples uh, to, I guess, model from. And so, yeah, I just Mm. went to the place. I I didn't even know what jujitsu was. I had no idea. Zero. I thought there was Mm. like punching and kicking and stuff. Um, So, yeah, I had that model to initially go in. And then, you know, like I am who I am. uh, Mm. So whatever I do, I'm going to bring that, you know, bring this Oscar flavor to it. Jiu-Jitsu is something that it, it does a lot of those things for you. And if you spend enough time there, it really kind of puts you through the tumble dryer of decreasing a bit of ego um, and increasing a, a bit of compassion. Uh, also mm-hmm. compassion in the sense of kinesthetic compassion. And it can lead that way. So we have emotional compassion and energetic compassion, personality compassion, which we would usually contribute to that word. But then there's also uh, kinetic compassion. So if I put my hand on you, I can feel your structure and I can feel where your weight is distributed. Uh, I can feel how you're organizing your skeleton, how much tension you have, where you have it. Um, And this is something that comes from those martial arts. Um, Mm not just jujitsu, like any contact martial art has this. Um, And so that kinetic compassion can lead to the other kind of compassion, which we're usually associated with. And the other thing with BJJ that is so good is just the contact. Like how many activities do we have in our culture, which basically puts you in full body contact with someone for like two hours? Mm. Crazy amount of contact time. And I I don't think that can be discounted as well. Like just so much closeness in that context. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know I just have a quick thing on that. I, I, I experienced that massively. Um, I've been doing jujitsu for about two, three years, I think at, at this point. And uh, I, I started a job. I hated it. <laughs> I hated that job. I lasted like three weeks. You know, it was just, I thought it it would be good for me. I went in there. Thank God there was a probationary period. It was just not for me at all. And um, it was, exactly, exactly. Felt it out, clarified my values as a mate of mine says. Um, And uh, it was a classic kind of desk job. We all had our different desks and so forth. And being someone who does jujitsu, whether it is the jujitsu, the sport itself, or what you said, which I think is a, is right the combination of the two the types of people that are interested in jujitsu you know what what it promotes body contact understanding um you know social dynamics from a physical perspective um just getting over yourself like dropping your ego who cares if you sweat a bit who cares if you fail all that kind of bullshit anyway i was here and i was as i was saying goodbye because it was my final day on the job i was going around and hugging people And I I had this just extreme sense of awkwardness. Like all of them just felt like it was really weird to to hug you, you know, maybe because there were males and females in there. I don't even know. I don't know why that would be a problem, but maybe it is for people. Office, you know, just promote like that desk situation promotes that separateness and that individuality. And there's like none of that is in there in jiu-jitsu, you know, in jiu-jitsu, Sure, you either win or you lose, but it's such a, you know, I'd I'd love for you to hear to hear about this from your perspective. But it's such a communal thing I've found. You know, it's a team sport in every other way apart from the actual specific rules of the game. But uh, have you know have you felt that at all outside of jujitsu? Like, have you seen a giant contrast? Or yeah, what's your experience been like with that social awkwardness? Mm, mm, yeah, mm. yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Um, yeah, I feel like everyone listening to this podcast will, will know it. Um, it's, it's in our face, you know, whether it's the latest political thing, right. Um, you know, we, we can't like the, the latest meme at the moment is we almost have to have anxiety about which 
pronoun to use on someone. Mm -hmm. Almost like we have to almost apologize as we use a pronoun, mm -hmm. getting it wrong. Um, Absolutely. Do that, by the way. I should <laughs> just let that go. But um, that's kind of the the current political theme with that. So it's it's all in our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, this it's like a repulsion at a certain socially accepted distance. We are allowed to get this close, and then no, no more. Mm -hmm. And that is a repulsion in physical body closeness. Like if I want to measure that in 30 centimeter rules, you know, at school we have the 30 centimeter rule. I wasn't allowed to like go too close to people. Um, you can measure that in acceptable questions that you can ask people. Mm. Uh, you can measure that in an acceptable amount of eye contact that you have with someone uh, before they get really uncomfortable and they just will like disconnect completely there. Yeah. It's all sorts. Yeah, it's all sorts in our culture. Um, in, in Australia here, we don't really have a dance culture that brings us close. We don't have a fighting culture that brings us close to like wrestle. Um, where Our culture is moving very much away from like the roughhousing. Um, there's a lot of talk from uh, guys like Rafe Kelly. And uh, he was the first person that I really heard talk about roughhousing, but I'm sure he you know, got it from other people too, but just encouraging roughhousing in our kids, like just wrestle mm. and rough with each other and be close and touch, get dirty. It's actually, it's a form of affection. Mm. It's a primal yeah. need too. If, if mice don't play when they're pups, they develop all different sorts of symptoms that mirror ADHD. You know, it's a very, very dangerous thing not to have <laughs> kids to play. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Why do you think Australia doesn't have uh, like a – uh, like a defined, um, uh, uh, like either roughhousing, dance culture, or kind of physical adapt ad adaptive culture that that we can express ourselves through. Yeah, I don't know. It's like I I, I have no idea. I'm just speculating here, um, and I haven't really given it too much thought either. But if I look at our main things, we tend to so the. Uh, a culture's movement, mm, like practices or themes, tend to mirror the environment that they're in. Uh, and Australia mm. has a lot of open space. And if you look at a lot of water and a lot of open space, and our mm. big games that we do, swimming, uh, surfing, mm -hmm. football, and cricket, and maybe like tennis too, I guess. Um, yeah. Soccer as well, the hockey, like all of these games that require like a shitload of space. Uh, whereas something like China, very small open space, and you see them excelling at uh, sports or movement practices that don't require much. Kung Fu, very deep into their culture, right? You can just practice that in a square meter if you want to. Ping pong, weightlifting, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. these things. Um, yeah, interesting. Interesting. Mm. interesting take. Mm. Uh, look, I really would love to fast forward a little bit, Oscar, to – uh, where you are currently in your movement practice, uh, you, as, as I mentioned in the little um, introduction, I've been a student of yours and I'd, I'd love you to just have a little bit of a um, discussion on how you've evolved your movement practice personally but also as a, as a teacher and how what you've learned from a meditation standpoint has impacted your physical movement practice as well. There's a few questions there. Yeah, big one, huh? Wow. Um, so I'm going to work backwards there. How has meditation affected uh, my movement practice and, and my teaching practice? Mm -hmm. It's given me a glue that glues everything together. Um, there is not so much separation between anything that I do now, anything that I say that I think, um, the places that I go. Meditation really gives that that glue. Uh, some people talk about it as the glue. Some people say like a center point, the eye of the storm, right? The stillness from which the, the movement operates around, but it's still part of the same entity, right? If you didn't have the eye of the storm, you wouldn't have the storm, vice versa. Um, so they create each other. Um, that principle of uh, definition versus negation, right? Like we draw a circle. Yep. And I draw a circle by definition, by drawing an actual circle, or I can shade the area of the circle 
thus creating the circle in the middle. So it's kind of mm-hmm. like physical practice, life, meditation. And they're, they're the same thing. It's just two lenses to approach the same thing. Um, I don't think you can really have such a clear experience of one without also experiencing the other to some degree. How much degree? Is that correct English? Or to what degree? <laughs> it really depends on uh, on the person, you know. You don't have to go to India and meditate for, you know, five years in a cave. Some people may, but most people don't. Uh, you just need to find that balance. So meditation's kind of given me that that uh, unshakable stillness at the center of everything that I do. Uh, mm. It allows me to act proactively and creatively as opposed to reacting destructively or defensively or any anything like this. And so there's a direct correlation for me between how much meditation I do and how uh, how effective I am in the world. And also, it's it's this crazy thing where effective, the more meditation I do, the more effective I become and the, the more I can create and the, the greater change that I can initiate mm. whilst the ease at which I do it also increases. Mm. It's opposite of the hustle culture where if I want to develop something, I work harder. It's the opposite. If I want to develop something great, I try and find the, the subatomic um, separating of the atom, right? I separate one atom, oof, oof, the blast is massive. Um, if I hold a stick right, right at the end and I move it, it only moves a little bit for my hand to move a lot. But then if I hold it right at the bottom of the stick, I can move my hand just a tiny bit and the end of the stick will move very far. So the more I can establish myself in this sense of stillness, in this sense of awareness, uh, slow myself down, expand my awareness, that's kind of like taking your hand further and further down to the very bottom of the stick. And so when I come Mm. in like that and move, the effect is far greater with less effort involved. Mm. Nice. I like that. Um, And so then in, I guess, real time, it allows me to act more relevantly as well. If someone comes to me, um, in need of some help, I am able to perceive what I think they actually are wanting and what they are needing. And I can more honestly give them that experience without Oscar getting in the way so much with his own, um, like preferences or needs or anything like that. I can really just be of service to people. Um, so that would be teaching. And then with my own practice, yeah, there's there's that element 100% there as well. I'm able to perceive what I need to do. Um, but then there's this fantastic kind of gelling of experiences that is very challenging for me. Um, I would say it's probably more challenging for me to gel my experience of meditation with movement in various forms than it is to gel it with this kind of teaching or social interaction, this emotional interaction that we that we have right now. Um, hmm. So essentially what I'm what I'm trying to develop is this um this constant simultaneity between the two where it's a movement practice when I meditate and it's a meditation practice when I move. Hmm. What do you feel the challenges are? Um, or why do you feel it's more challenging to implement um y- your meditation into your own movement practice rather than teaching? That's an amazing question. Um it's it's my stuff. Mm. my stuff 100 percent um yeah i just i guess i have more stuff uh like tied up in attachment with Mm. Mm. my training and my movement practice than i do with i guess dealing with with other people or interacting with other people and and i guess this role as a teacher Mm. um And, you know, we all have that. Every single person is this wonderfully unique mixture of their own stuff. Uh, Some, you know, some people will be able to let go of certain things 
and the next person will hold on so tightly to that same thing and vice versa you know like we're we're all unique we all have the the shadow and this is you know shadow work if anyone listening doesn't know what that is you can just google up shadow work uh there's a lot of research uh resources on it and it's basically the stuff that we don't want to look at so <clears> if you can we don't want to look at we want to but it's very challenging to look at or we just have no idea that it's there Mm. that's the shadow um well my definition of it i'm sure someone who's an expert would be able to articulate it much better um yeah so why i find it more challenging with my training is is i would say that from what i can perceive yeah you know i think that having your own stuff woven into what you do and what you give to others is actually like a precondition of a really good teacher because they have their own skin in the game. Mm. Uh, like as opposed to someone who's a psychologist who just does it for a job, you know, and there's obviously to become a psychologist, you know, you have to do all the training and the degrees and so forth. So you, you're obviously going to help people. Same with being a, a coach when it comes to calisthenics and movement and mindfulness and so forth. But to actually have your own personal selfish reason as to why you're doing it so that you're showing up not only for them, but for yourself as well, to me sounds like, I mean, it sounds like, you know, that would be the type of person that I would want to learn from. <laughs> There's a reason they're doing it as well, you know? Yes. Um, I heard this quote when I was maybe, yeah, maybe when I was like 16, 17 or something by Bruce Lee. And it took me five years or so to figure it out, maybe even longer. Uh, and the quote is, a good teacher protects his students from his own influence. Mm. What I heard, I'm like, oh, like I knew there was something there, but I'm like, I had no idea. It took me years to kind of appreciate it. Mm. Um, That's uh, something I'll be kind of devouring myself over the, the coming days, I think. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds so paradoxical, but it's so <laughs> spot on. Yeah, a good teacher protects his students from his own influence. Mm. Yeah, truly listen to your student and give them what they're asking for. Mm. Mm. And give it to them in the amount that they can digest. Let's use an analogy of eating. If you come to my house for a meal and you say, hey, I, I'm a vegetarian and I feed you roast lamb, you don't want that. Although you came to eat something, I've not given you what you wanted. You may eat it, but you'll eat it begrudgingly and you won't want to come back. Mm. The next aspect, maybe I serve you this amazing vegetarian meal, exactly what you asked for. You reach the point where you're really full and perfectly full. You have energy from the meal. It's going to sustain you. It's going to give you life. And then I just keep force feeding you. The classic, uh, <laughs> the classic Jewish mother, Polly. <laughs> oh, I, I know because I have grandparents like this. <laughs> you know, just the constant feeding. And what that can do is it kills the appetite. If I just overfeed somebody, it kills their appetite and they're going to miss a few meals and maybe not want to come back as well because it's a bit of a resistful experience. So when you teach somebody, yeah, you need to really listen to your student. What do they want? What are they asking for? Mm. What they're asking for may not always be asked for with words. Mm. Right. So you really need to perceive them, uh, listen to them, and then give them enough, not too much. Mm. And how do you know how much you've given them? Is that was that would that be something that you ask them? Like you as as direct as what are you wanting from this? And use all your faculties, all of your senses, all of your skills, all of your intellectual models to put lenses on things, switch perspectives. Uh, your intuition, which we can say would be the sum, the undescribable sum of all of those things I just mentioned. Mm. Uh, yeah, use use everything. You just listen. You know, like how do you know if someone comes to you distressed about something, how do you know to give them a hug? Yeah. Like how do you know what to do in that moment kind of thing? Mm. Uh, Absolutely. But then, you know, so there's that, but then you – you need to go in and support 
specific layers with education on your part, right? If you if you only know a handful of exercises to teach somebody, then you can only give them those handful of exercises mm. from an exercise point of view, right? You may be able to give them other stuff, but yeah. Yeah, well, your vocabulary is limited. Yep, yep, yep. Makes sense. You could you could create you could create an amazing story in a particular genre, but your genres your your genre library is is limited. <laughs> yes. Uh you know, if you want to be good at speaking English, you have to have a big vocabulary, then you have to understand grammar, and then you put it together into conversation. So it grows like this in, in any field. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Like, uh, uh, stands on the shoulders of the other. You don't have to do it sequentially. Um, I saw this, um, I saw like a meme the other day or like a little snapshot news article. Uh, English man wins French Scrabble uh, national championship without being able to speak any French. That's awesome. And I loved it. I sent it to heaps of people. Perfect example of someone who's just developed vocabulary and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Not really that into the other layers. And we can also have, uh, a, a, so that would be like a top-down approach. We can also have a bottom-up approach where it would be, let's say the natural athlete who is amazing. Like let's say a, a freak footballer who just blitzes the field has absolutely no idea what they're doing in terms of being able to articulate it to someone else. Yeah. Fantastic, terrible teacher because they can't dice what they're doing back down the layers. They don't have that mm. awareness of what they're doing. They are doing the other layers, but it's, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I was, we, we, we could sit here and talk to you for forever and ever. Perhaps it would be a great idea to get you back on the show and really focus uh, on some some other topics, but I'm aware that your time is limited. Um, th thank you so much for jumping on and having a chat. Third time was definitely a charm, and <laughs> let's try and create a fourth one, hey? I would love to. Yeah, name a date and I'm there. It was Beautiful. Fun. Amazing. Well, was um, very Thank quickly, you. mate, where can people find you? Uh, probably uh, good old Instagram is the best. Uh, it's, you know, the business card these days. Uh, so it's just my name, Oscar Mierman, uh, and you'll find me. I think I have a little black and white photo of me doing a handstand or something. Perfect. Yeah. Thank All you right. so much, Oz. We will speak to you very, very soon. Enjoy the rest of this beautiful day we've got before us. Thank you, boys. You too. Thank you for having me on and look forward to next time.